Rumor tells of an ancient and weather-beaten skeleton caught in the folds of the furthest outcrop of rock from the beach. I shiver as I pull my jacket a little tighter around my shoulders. Dispel any tropical aesthetic that the word beach may have conjured up in your mind. The cold and tumbled stones I stand upon this evening form a beach in name only. I won't say exactly where one could find this stretch of grim, stone-peppered sand, but it lies on the Irish west coast, between two low and grey-green cliffs. The outcrop is visible from here, normally a stony island far out at sea, marked by a large and knife-shaped rock stuck out in an angle towards the sky. But this evening, the outcrop is reachable. A rare bout of extreme low tide has created a winding path between the largest groupings of stone, a trail leading out through the water, and it is one that I am set to follow. I tie up my hair and hop down onto the stones of the beach with a crunch. The weather conditions are good. Low mist, no rain. There's a little wind, and the sky is overcast gray. But as I said, this is the Irish West Coast. I wouldn't expect anything else. My name is Searsha. I like to take pictures of stuff. That's my backstory. I don't actually believe for a minute that there's any mermaid skeleton out there on the rock but there must be something. Something to give rise to such a rumor. The tide is low. I'm wearing bright colors for visibility, and I have my phone. I'm safe, and I'm curious. I want to see. I cross the length of beach and step out onto the first flat stone watching the seawater lap steadily at its edges. It's slippery, so I walk as flat-footed and as carefully as I can. A seagull's call is carried on the wind past my ears, but I keep my gaze focused on the rock beneath my feet as I walk. The gentle waves froth white against the stone. It's a lot further out than it looks, actually. But I'm over halfway there. No point in turning back now. The cliffs are way behind me. I glance up. The sun hovers above the tip of the outcrop's key identifier, the stone in the shape of the knife. Its light is a white blur behind the gray. I squint against a whirl of icy wind, gritting my teeth and clutching to the camera around my neck on instinct. Just a little further. I step from rock to rock, with the occasional hop when the stone dips beneath the surface. And with a slip and a murmur of quick distress, I land on the final outcrop, lurching clumsily forwards and steadying myself against the rock knife for balance. It's bigger up close than it appears from the shore. It's taller than me, for one thing. I catch my breath and I take a step back. The outcrop is curiously shaped, like an arc, kind of, a semicircle of sorts. I clamber past the largest of the rocks, the knife and step over a low smattering of sea-beaten boulders to the other side, the side that faces away from the beach. Ahead, there is nothing but open sea. But to my right, to my right, nestled among the stones and surrounded by clusters of wave-thrown shells and pebbles, is the tail end of a skeleton. 
Surely it can be nothing else. Such rows of thin and spine-like blades of faded cream, the wider fin like blades at the tip, tucked just below a ridge of rock and out of the wind. Honestly, it's a wonder that the tide hasn't taken it all away. I walk around the edge of the outcrop. The wind rumbles in my ears. And around the corner, behind a sea-smothered boulder, the skeleton of the great fish ends in a human torso. I stare at it in disbelief. I laugh, first of all. It must be a prank. But the laughter fades. The laughter fades and I find myself mesmerized by this impossibility. This anomaly out here on the rocks. The body is human. There's no doubt about that. Ribs and spine. The skull is lolled to the side and wedged against the slippery stone. It is still human to my eye, though the teeth, the teeth are much sharper than one would expect to find in the body of a human, man or woman. Easy, Searsha, I mutter to myself out loud. This thing isn't real. It can't be. But I cannot look away. The skeleton is mesmerizing in its beauty. Ethereal. Yet sad. I remove my camera from around my neck and snap a couple photos. I reach down to the bones. And after a brief hesitation, grab hold of one of its ribs. It disconnects from the slimy rock with a little crunch and a burst of seawater droplets. And I become at once aware that my surroundings have changed. The change is difficult to place, however, and I do not notice the lack of light until I turn to the west to look to the horizon. The sun has disappeared, and the sky's dark edge has blurred with the end of the sea. The sea is choppier now. It froths and crashes maliciously against the outcrop and draws with it the rising winds. I take a step back, a little higher up and away from the water. I turn towards the beach. But the way back is lost. Impossible, I think to myself, beginning to panic. This cannot be. But time has definitely passed. I've become aware of the gentle ache in my legs, as if they had been held in place for a long period of time. My breathing becomes shallower. The outcrop is an island once again. It stands far out from the shore, alone and dark in the night. Help! I choke out, then clear my throat and try again. Help! But there is no response. Fuck. Oh, fuck. But it's okay. I still have my phone. Both hands are occupied, one with the camera and the other with the bone. I step away from the waves as I grab the strap of the camera, and my foot splats wetly against the smooth stone. I stumble and slip with a shout, and I swing down my hand to protect my face as I fall to the rocks, smashing the camera hard against the stone in the process. Glass and plastic burst out at all angles as I land on my side, grunting in pain. A wave washes the cold water of the Atlantic up and against my body and I shiver as I haul myself angrily back to my feet. The camera is ruined. 
I swear in frustration and loop the strap around my neck nonetheless, just in case anything can be salvaged once back on land. If you make it back to land, Sirsha. I reach a shaking hand down into my pocket for my phone. Except it's not there. Now I am really starting to panic. I check my other pocket. I check all four of them. I search through every pocket in my jacket, then I repeat the entire process twice more. But it's not there. The phone I was so sure that I remembered is simply not with me. I must have left it behind. My heart bangs like a drum in my chest. I spin round back to the beach, foolishly near slipping for a second time, and shout again for help, screaming, Help! Please! But the beach is dark and deserted. There is no one, and my calls go unanswered. I swivel, facing west, hyperventilating. I look down at the long, thin, curved bone from the skeleton in my hand. For reasons unknown, I am still holding it. A part of me doesn't want to let it go. Something glitters in the sea and catches my eye. I lift my gaze, retreating as far as I am able. Out there, in the dark water, pale blue lights shimmer beneath the surface flickering. The froth and ebb and pull of the waves lose their rhythm. Or at least, they do in the sea right in front of me. And to my horror, a figure begins an ascent from beneath. As if walking on hidden stone steps, he gradually rises. I press my back up against the knife-shaped rock. There is nowhere for me to go. I can only watch in terror as the shimmering, gray-skinned monstrosity strides from the sea. The man, for it is a man albeit one warped and distorted, wears a torn and tattered salt-stained robe, dripping and wet, though the material might once have been white. His eyes are like those of a great fish, bulging out from the sides of his face, lidless and staring. He comes to a stop about two meters in front of me, his feet are submerged in the water, but I cannot tell what, if anything, he is standing on. I do it. The fishman warbles, revealing a mouth lined with sharp yellow teeth. They are very different to the teeth in the skull of the mermaid skeleton. His are much longer and thinner. A glance down to the base of his robes reveals two shrouded, but still visible legs. They are not of the same stock, these two creatures. I stare in silence, still clutching the bone. The creature stares at it and slithers a tongue out over his teeth. His voice is the chill of a winter's wind. You have taken it upon yourself to tamper with a relic held very dear to our hearts, sinner of the land. I would question why you would do such a thing. I, I'm sorry, I stutter back. I didn't mean to. I was just curious is all. Please, I don't know what's happening. 
I cannot blame a soul for a little curiosity. The being replies. She is a beautiful thing, after all. But she was not yours to break. Yet break her you have, sinner of the land. I'm sorry, I swear. I'm no sinner. We are all sinners. The creature replies somberly as thunder rolls over the distant sea. I... I can put it back, I say, swallowing with a dry throat, moving to return the bones to its original place. But the creature's eyes flash and bulge. Its lips peel back, and those terrible teeth are revealed with a sharp intake of breath. He puts out a hand towards me. A hand that is more of a fin, really. The finger-like appendages held together with thin, translucent gray webbing. I freeze. Ah, he says. As it happens, land sinner, explorer from across the stones. There is a simple way for you to make amends for your trespass. Intended or otherwise. The skeleton of the mermaid fair is held in naught but the highest regard among my congression. I would ask that she be returned to us. Back to where she belongs. Her bones belong in our cathedral, Landwoman. Let us take her home. I consider this man, this thing from beneath the sea. He does not appear outwardly aggressive. But he is a monster, his fine words notwithstanding. If he were to lunge suddenly forwards, to come after me, I think I would probably collapse with sheer fright. Okay, I replied cautiously. And the man-thing twitches, his fin fingers clench. Come take her. She's yours. Oh, the creature says. Oh, but no. I cannot touch so precious a relic myself. Please, just gently place her bones into the sea by my feet. One by one. Will you do so? Will you agree to these terms? I hesitate. I do this for you. And you'll help me. You'll help me get back home. Ah, my dear lady. He replies. With a wet hiss that might well have been the edge of a chuckle. Home is a curious thing. And the wind becomes a little sharper. I laugh nervously in response. But there is no humor in it. With a swirling, crashing, cascading circle of waves out beyond the sea, something tall and shadowy arises from the water. It brings with it many of the pale blue lights. It's a spire, I realize. Like one you'd see on a cathedral, but black and twisted. Up it rises, up and out of the sea. I stare at it in terror and wonder. Place the bones at my feet. Then go for the next. 
speaks the monster. Just a little too harshly. I back away, eyes darting between him and the impossible spire in the sea. All right. Hold on now. Just hold on. I manage in response. Just tell me you'll help me get back to shore. Place the bones into the water. She belongs to us. We will take care of her. The creature replies, eyes fixated on the rib in my hand. He makes to take a step toward me. Stay back! I shout. My uncertainty returned tenfold. Stay back or I'll break the bone. I'll do it. I'll destroy them all. You could not do so were you to try, woman. The creature hisses, his amicability fading fast. His expression remains anxious, however. I can't tell if he's bluffing. I try not to look at the dark spire behind him, far out into the waves. It fills me with a cold and alien dread. I just want to get back to shore. I don't care about any of this. Can you help me get back to the land, yes or no? He hisses. You agreed. Place her bones into the water before it is too late. My stomach turns. I become aware that something massive, some colossal and ancient shadow, has begun to circle the outcrop upon which I stand. I sense it slithering around and around beneath the dark and frothing waves. The martyred man takes a step toward me. I jump in fright and brandish the rib like a sword in shaking hands. He backs off at once, almost too quickly, an expression of horror passing fast across his face. You would wield so sacred a relic in such a blasphemous way, you honorless landwoman. He licks his teeth, eyes flickering between my own and the rib. You would fare better were you to reject the sins of the land and embrace the serenity of the sea. You can begin your redemption by placing the bones of the skeleton into the water. Return her to where she belongs! Movement catches my eye out at sea. I glance over the creature's shoulder and he turns to look as well. Something is left out from the waves. Something light in the dark. It was too quick for me to see, but there it is again, appearing near the dark spire. I believe it, at first, to be a pale dolphin of some kind. But it's not. It's a human, or a rough equivalent, with its lower half in the form of a sparkling silver fish. I look from it to the skeleton, then back. The silver shape strikes the spire as it passes by on its arc, and another of its kind appears from the opposite side. Then another, and another, Dark clusters of black stone are burst forth from the tower from every assault, and the creature directly in front of me spins back around. He is panicked now. Desperation has seeped into his voice. He claps together his hands before him, soaked and sea-torn robes billowing in the winds. I'll return you to the land, if that's what you want. I'll get you back to shore. We all will. Just please, place the skeleton of the mermaid fair into the water. 
It has to be now, I beg you. But I do not. Do it! He screeches. Please, place her bones into the water. Let us take her home. But I follow my god and deny the creature his wish. He hisses and curses. He swears in a language I do not understand. And then he turns, striding quickly back beneath the churning waters on invisible steps. A wave carries up over his head and crashes out at the rocks beneath my feet. And he is gone. I carefully return the taken bones to its original place. And it holds. I look back out to sea and watch the assault on the towers as my hair is whipped about my face. The spire starts to slowly descend. And I watch it disappear from sight as drizzle begins to fall from the sky. Drizzle that quickly becomes a torrent of freezing rain. The enormous shape that circled the outcrop has departed, I can sense. It has left me be, for now. But it has been replaced by others. Pale bodies in the water, with silver and shimmering tails. They move too fast and swim too deep for me to get a good look, but they are the creatures that attacked the tower. Unlike the robed monster with bulging eyes and fish-like fins, these entities remain in the water. They circle me, slowly, but they are watching. They are watching me carefully. I can feel it. I crouch down and huddle against the rock. Arms wrapped about my knees. And I look out to sea. I allow the night to creep by as the rain leaks down my face. Drifting in and out of consciousness. Hour after hour I wait. The temptation to study the mermaid skeleton once again, to draw from it another bone, perhaps, is strong. I allow it to wash over me, but I do not let it take hold. And as sure as the sun must rise in the morning, the sea, to my exhausted relief, begins to settle. Light returns to the world, and I realize that the creatures that circled the outcrop are circling no more. The tide returns to a level that will allow me to walk all the way back to shore. A rarity, but one that I do not question, and one that I do not take for granted. I clamber to my stiff and aching legs. Then with a grunt, I jump awkwardly from stone to stone and steadily back to the beach. As I do so, I refrain from looking back. In truth, I do not know what the creature wanted with the skeleton. Perhaps he was genuine. Though, to be honest, I quite doubt it. I don't know what horrors lay hidden beneath the waves. Horrors that, to my relief, were only merely teased. And I don't know the story behind the skeleton as much as I wish I did. It's a story that screams to be told. A case that is just begging to be explored. And it's for this reason. Whenever I ask myself 
if I'll ever return to that outcrop. I find that I do not know the answer. Greetings, friends and fiends. Chronicler here. We here at Creepy Spaghetti would like to thank Darkly Gathers for allowing us to tell their story. If you enjoyed this story, be sure to subscribe to stay updated on these terrible tales. And be sure to check out the author in the links below. If you're interested in having your story narrated, be sure to reach out to our humble overseer as he continues his journey to pull the darkest stories from the infinite depths of the internet. Until next time, fiends. And remember, we are darkness.